as a result of milling our own flour and having this extra grain, we just decided to start experimenting, growing it in our allotment. And um, as a result, I've learnt a lot from the process. Um, we purchased a threshing machine and I've even threshed wheat. Um, last year we got about seven kilos off of our allotment, um, which was good. Um, and also, I started to understand practically why farmers moved away from whole wheat to the naked wheat. Hi, welcome to We Sow. And in today's episode, I'm going to talk to you about wheat. And this episode is the first in a series which we have entitled From Grain to Loaf. And in this series, we're going to go through the process of growing wheat, harvesting it, and finally, baking bread, which Dion will demonstrate in a future episode. However, for today, I'm going to go through a foundation whereby we look at the origins and development of wheat. We touch on some questions surrounding wheat. And lastly, looking at why we decided to start milling our own flour and also growing our own wheat. So keep watching as we begin this journey. The origin of wheat can be traced to a region of the world which is known as the Fertile Crescent. The Fertile Crescent is represented on maps as a boomerang shaped region which spans close to Egypt, a little north of Israel, through to Mesopotamia and through to the Persian Gulf, which is known today as um, Iran and Iraq. Now at this time in the ancient world, the wheat that would have existed in the wild was known as the wild einkorn, which is known by its um, scientific name as Triticum Boaticum. Now this type of grain was actually a grass and it by wheat standards was very short, a very short straw in the sense that it only grew to about two feet high. And another characteristic was that this grass had a very tight hull which meant that the grain was very difficult to separate from its husk. Now as human beings noticed the value of this grain for nutritional purposes they started to cultivate it. And as a result, what happens in cultivation is that plants change in response to how they're cultivated. And as a result, the domesticated einkorn was born. And this is known as Triticum monococcum. Now the domesticated einkorn actually crossbred with another variety of grass, a type of grass which um, scientists class as part of a family of agilops but the scientists aren't clear of exactly which member of that part of the grass family it crossed with. And so the fact that domesticated einkorn crossbred so early into its history shows that um, the idea that the difference between older wheats and modern wheats today is that the old varieties were pure and that the new ones came about through crossbreeding with other grasses, it shows that actually that's not true, that from the earliest cultivation of wheat, wheat was crossbreeding on its own. And as a result of the einkorn crossbreeding, a variety of wheat emerged which was called emma wheat. And this is known as Triticum dicocum. Now the emma wheat was very common in Bible times. It was cultivated right throughout the region and it had a similar characteristic to the einkorn in that the hull around it was very tight, so, very, so it was very difficult to remove the grain from the hull. However, what's interesting about this is that all of the grains that would be in a field when you are growing um, grains would not be, were not identical. And so ancient farmers noticed that some of the grains that in their fields would separate easily from the husk. And these easy to separate grains, they tended to be larger in size. And so what would have happened was that the ancient farmers collected these up and isolated them or separated them from the rest of the field and then decided that this would become a new variety of wheat, which was called Durham wheat, which is known as Triticum Durham. And in fact, Durham wheat is the exact same wheat that is used to make all our pasta because contrary to popular belief, the wheat that we use today for our products isn't all the same variety 
for certain things you need certain types of wheat and in the case of pasta it's always durum wheat because the other types don't have the characteristics should I say to um, to give rise to pasta. So durum wheat and emmer wheat existed in ancient times, in bible times and one variety, the, the durum wheat as we've said separated easily and this is what is known as naked wheat which is free threshing in the sense that if you thresh it or apply a lot of force to it, it separates easily from the grain. Whereas the emmer wheat, which like its ancestor, the einkorn, had that tight hull, was known as non-threshing in the sense that um, it had this very tight hull because it was um, what's known as, it's not naked wheat. Following this, there was more crossbreeding that took place in the process of agriculture. So we had a situation where different varieties of emma crossbred with another type of grass in the Agilops family. In this case, it was the Agilops torshi, which is a type of grass known as goat grass. And some varieties of emma that crossbred with this goat grass gave rise to what we now have today as common wheat. But the ones that did they retained the characteristic that durum wheat had, which is that they had larger grains and were three free threshing. Whereas the other varieties of, um, wheat, of emma wheat that crossbred with the goat grass retained the tight hull, similar to the emma and to the einkorn, and this became known as spelt. So effectively, spelt and common wheat emerged as through the same ancestry through the same crossbreeding, the only difference is that one retained the free threshing nature that was already found in the durum wheat and others retained the characteristic on the other side of its family, which was to be um, tightly hulled and not free threshing. One outlier in the story of wheat is another variety which emerged. And this is one that has recently been brought back to market, which is known oftentimes as camut wheat. Now, the reality is that in terms of a wheat species, there is no such thing as camut wheat. Camut is simply just a marketing term which is used, um, which comes from the company or the brand that decided to bring this variety of wheat back. And the actual name is Corazan wheat. And this variety of wheat emerged as a result of crossbreeding that happened in ancient times between the durum wheat and, the, and also what is known as um, Polish wheat or Triticum polonicum. And this type of wheat, like its ancestor the durum wheat, has the larger grains and is an easier to thresh grain. And so this is another outlier in the story. But what we have seen so far by just looking at this history and development is that wheat has always been hybridizing and crossbreeding with other grasses. When discussing wheat, an important area to consider is the genetics. And there are three main classifications that relate to wheat when we look at the different varieties. So the earlier forms of wheat would have been known as what is called diploid wheat because they would have had two sets of seven chromosomes, so that's 2n. Then there is tetraploid, which would have had four sets, so that's 4n. And then lastly, there is hexaploid, which would be 6n, because that's six sets of chromosomes. Um, so with diploid, that would be 14. With tetraploid, that would be 28. And then lastly, with the hexaploid, that would be 42 chromosomes. Now, the reason that's important is because these characteristics distinguish and tell a story about the evolution of the wheat. Because when the wheat first developed in the time of the domesticated einkorn, it was diploid. However, because the einkorn crossbred, what happens with hybridization is that the chromosomes have to double in order for the plant to maintain its fertility. And so as a result, the emma wheat and the durum wheat that emerged from the einkorn was tetraploid.
And then following this, when there was another crossbreeding event which led to the cousins common wheat and also spelt, there was another process of um, the chromosomes increasing to maintain the fertility of the plant. And these became hexaploid wheats. So einkorn was a diploid, emma and then also durham and also I believe corazon would fall into category of tetraploid and then the last category is hexaploid as they have the most chromosomes and that is both spelt and common wheat. Now this is important because at each crossbreeding event, as the chromosomes doubled, their in immunoreactive profile increases. So that's the likelihood of reactions with the human immune system. Now this is important to consider when we consider things such as, um, from a health standpoint, um, consumption of wheat, um, as there's a lot of um, information going around suggesting that modern varieties of wheat, because they're hexaploid, they are the most reactive and therefore we need to go back to the older varieties. However, the interesting thing is that oftentimes spelt is recommended as being better for people, but the reality of it is that spelt is also a hexaploid wheat. And when we look at the history, common wheat or bread wheat has existed from before the time of Christ. And so the reality is that it is true that the immunoreactive profile does increase with each stage of the, of, um, the development. So diploid, tetraploid, hexaploid. However, we've been eating hexaploid wheat for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And the ancient people consuming hexaploid wheat didn't have any problems. And so then it, this bit of information is just to kind of um, clarify the fact that when we look at what is taking place today with um, concerns regarding wheat, that maybe we need to consider some other factors um, rather than just the variety of wheat when establishing whether some varieties are better than others. Um, I can personally say that given that we've been eating diploid, tetraploid and hexaploid for a long time before modern times shows that it's not necessarily the variety of wheat but maybe there might be other things to consider. So what is gluten? Gluten is the protein that is found in a variety of grains. So it is found in grains such as wheat, barley and also rye. Um, those are the ones that I know for certain contain gluten naturally. And gluten is as a protein it contains different characteristics or different parts and the major part of um, gluten is known as gliadin um, and I believe that it's roughly 60% um, in some cases of what the gluten structure. Now gluten as a protein is what gives dough its elasticity and so as a result the gluten content affects um, the baking qualities that we're looking for. So for example in the case of pasta, interestingly enough um, the durum wheat, which I mentioned, has existed since ancient times. It has lower gluten levels, for example, even more lower than for spelt or common wheat. And that's because in order for its structure in making pasta, um, that hard structure, it has to have less gluten. Um, however, in the case of common wheat and um, spelt, the gluten is actually similar. In fact, I believe the gliadin is actually higher in spelt. Um, as far as the question of um, gluten, this is where concern comes in, in that um, there's been a lot of reports about sensitivities and also things such as celiac disease. And um, the discomfort caused is very real in the case of the celiacs especially. Um, but the interesting thing is that in society, there has been this rise in which a large number or an even larger number should I say of people outside of the celiacs etc are having problems with wheat and so right now gluten is being blamed as the cause of this problem. Now the interesting thing is that um, from the th things that I've seen concerning wheat there are many there are people who've had discomfort from consuming wheat and then being encouraged to use spelt 
and then they've been fine and the reality is that if it was the gluten that was the problem solely then even the spelt would be a problem and what you find is that people who genuinely have a problem with wheat they can't even eat the spelt and so looking at this issue of gluten um, my understanding is that whilst it may be convenient to regard all problems with wheat as being caused by gluten the picture I believe is more complex than that because for example the only difference between spelt and common wheat why some people experience don't experience discomfort when they eat it is just that spelt is more water soluble um, so if it was just the gluten that would that wouldn't matter there would still be a reaction and so the fact that there are some people who can consume um, for example spelt and not have any problem shows that the possibility is that there may be something more going on with the digestive system that results in a sensitivity rather than the gluten itself um, so for example if we consider things such as um, if we consider in the plant kingdom we have certain types of foods which we could regard as difficult to digest now in nature the be there is a benefit in certain foods being more difficult to digest because they stimulate the immune system and that stimulus actually encourages the immune system to actually work it's a bit like a slight fire drill which isn't necessarily a problem however if you think about factors such as the western diet which has changed our microbiome the fact that we've been eating a lot of processed foods that we eat a lot of sh um, refined sugar and things of that nature which feed bad bacteria and cause the digestive system to be in poor health in the western world then it is no surprise that when we do eat foods that are more difficult to digest that we have trouble but the cause is not necessarily always to do with the food per se but rather we should consider that the reaction shows that we have digestive problems in general which may need to be addressed um, and so gluten is a very interesting area um, and my understanding really is that there is more to this picture than meets the eye and that whilst gluten problems for certain people is definitely real um, I believe that in this modern context that there is hope for some people who experience discomfort when consuming wheat products. When talking about wheat, the way that it's grown is a very important area to, to understand. So wheat, as I've mentioned earlier, is a grass. And this grass, as mentioned in its original form, the wild einkorn, was a very short plant, only about two feet high which is short by, by um, our ideas of what wheat should look like. And when growing this grass in order to produce grain, the important things that affected it was its ability to compete with weeds and its ability to extract nutrients. And so by the time wheat had um, developed from its original form to the Emma form and had become taller, that was an advantage that human beings prized in ancient days because the taller straw wheat, because there's two types, there's short straw wheat and then there's long straw wheat. The long straw wheat could send down its roots deeper and extract more nutrients and also was able to compete or outcompete weeds better. Um, and that was good in regards to, um, you know, the convenience of um, dealing with weeds, for example. However, the disadvantage that emerged, emerges from these taller varieties of wheat, why they've become less popular in these days, is the fact that they tended to bend under the weight of their heads oftentimes, which is what farmers know as lodging. And when they bend and they start to tip towards the ground and bunch up, that's where the grain can start to go off and there can be higher losses of viable grain and so this is part of the reason why although we think of ancient wheat as being very tall that um, actually over time um, agricultural pressures have eventually led to um, shorter wheats that were similar in height to the einkorn um, being more popular today. Another consideration concerning wheat also is um, the way that it pollinates. Now the interesting thing about that is that um, wheat is a wind pollinating plant 
Um, so it's um, pollen doesn't have any scent or anything like that and the pollen will emerge on the head of the wheat after the head has come through and it starts to look like this kind of light dusting these like flakes and because it's wind pollinated naturally it can also pollinate itself and so wheat is often self fertile and that tends to mean that the genetic qualities passed on tend to be the same. Um, however, because naturally it is a wind pollinated plant in the right conditions, um, in originally wheat would crossbreed in the sense that pollen would go from one plant to the next. And so then you would originally have fields that were genetically diverse. Now, as time has gone on and we've been, human beings have been very strict about separating wheat that had slight differences and giving it different names, um, that has been less likely. And so as a result, um, the fields of wheat have tended to become more genetically identical. Um, and so the danger with that is obviously crop losses when disease comes. And so as a result, we've ended up in a situation whereby two options result where we where the farmer can have a field which has more diverse um, plants in them in the sense that they may be the same variety or similar varieties but they're not all exactly the same and so they'll naturally cross um, and so that's called yield and quality wheat and then there's a situation where farmers have sought to um, crossbreed with um, other varieties of wheat to restore some of that genetic diversity. Now um, that's a, a point of consideration because um, when wheat has de had developed over time, um, human beings took it to different parts of the world and as these different plants um, adapted to the environment, they developed slightly different characteristics and so then each new variety would be called a land race. And so wheat that was taken, for example, to Japan reverted back to the height of the einkorn, which was very short. And so that was a different land race, whereas wheat taken maybe to um, another part of, maybe some part of Europe would develop slightly dif different characteristics and be called another land race. And so what took place was a process whereby um, human beings through translocation and different growing conditions would also develop different varieties within each type of wheat. So there would be different types of common wheat um, and also different types of um, emma wheat, etc. And so this is known as land races. And um, lastly, concerning um, this area of how wheat grows is the conditions. So a lot of times there's concern about gluten and um, the how it's grown in the fields and, and how that affects its gluten content. Although the science is not 100% certain that every case of um, reaction to wheat is linked to the amount of gluten or how it was grown, the fact remains, however, that um, even if that is the case, that the variety of the wheat is not the most important factor in how much gluten is contained, but rather how it was grown. So for example, a soil that has more nitrogen will have more gluten or the structure will be different um, and also if the conditions have less rain or more rain then it will also change the amount of protein that's in the wheat um, and those things matter more than the variety of wheat um, so therefore on that basis um, it's not simply a case that one variety is better than another when it comes to the properties um, of the nutrients or the proteins but rather the more important factor is how it's grown. But even then it's debatable what impacts that actually has. What about modern wheat? Where did it come from? Is it really a hybrid of other grasses? Now, as we've looked at um, the development of wheat, um, what we see is that there are different types of wheat which emerged throughout the history of um, human agriculture and they all existed in ancient times in some form. So we mentioned that the wild einkorn was the first, but then we had the emma, we also had the durum, we had corazan, spelt and then also common wheat. And all of these varieties of wheat existed in ancient times. So that fact shows us that 
The variety of wheat is not what defines ancient because as mentioned all of these varieties existed thousands of years ago. When people use the term modern wheat really what it's discussing is varieties of wheat that have continued to have new land races developed and I mentioned land races before so um, for example most of the time we look at the common wheat, the bread wheat, as being the modern wheat. When as mentioned it existed in the past, it existed before the time of Christ. It's even been found in ancient Roman burial sites and which shows that common bread wheat has been around for millennia. However, when we talk about um, modern varieties of wheat we think okay bread, pasta and the interesting thing with that is that the, bread, the wheat that is used in pasta is not the common wheat, it's actually the durum wheat which is even older than the common wheat. And so how is it that we're able to lump durum wheat and also common wheat into the category of modern wheat? And that's simply by the, the development of further sub-varieties or land races. So common wheat existed in the past, durum wheat existed in the past. However, the reason why these wheats became the dominant wheat in today is because of what I mentioned earlier about the hull, hulling of wheat. So, the, so for example, Emma and also Einkorn have these tight hulls and so do spelt, whereby it's very difficult to get the husk off. And so in the case of um, the history of wheat, from the time we had the Durham wheat, which had these larger grains, which were, they call it naked, whereby the grains separate easier during the threshing process. Um, those varieties of wheat which were naked became popular because if you think about ancient human beings who need to survive, if you have a variety of wheat which is easier to, um, to process after harvesting, so it's easier to thresh, easy to separate the grains out without the needs of pestles and mortars to spend countless hours or days processing on top of the overall threshing process and the winnowing process and all of that, um, human farmers on the basis of survival and intelligence opted to retain the use of naked wheat such as durum and also such as the common wheat. Um, even in the case of the spelt actually, the, the spelt um, the earliest records of spelt, I believe, go to a region known as Transcaucasia, which is um, around, um, Georgia, I believe it's around um, Azerbaijan, Georgia, that, that type of region. And um, so the primary reason why it was used was, be was because other varieties of wheat were, may not have been as available. But once naked wheats became available, they became popular. Um, even down to the colonization of the United States, the only wheat that they had during that era that they brought with them primarily were varieties of common wheat, different land races such as Turkish red, etc. And for the settlers, having free threshing naked wheat, it made sense from a survival standpoint to grow this. In fact, spelt didn't reach the United States till the 1890s. Um, so it goes to show that the wheat that was being eaten for even within our generations and if we were to go back many generations before was actually common wheat and it was purely the advantage from an agricultural standpoint that made it popular. Then what has happened is that um, newer varieties of the common wheat have been developed in response to different environments. So I've mentioned for example Japanese common wheat was very short and so in different environments the common wheat adapted and became different sub varieties and so when we talk about modern wheat all it is is just any variety of wheat that has had um, new varieties developed in recent times so it's not the species of wheat that makes it ancient but rather have they made new varieties from it um, in recent times and the answer is yes in the case of common wheat and durum wheat. However, one thing that is often um, not common knowledge is that even spelt, most of the spelt that I saw in the stores is actually modern varieties of spelt. Um, and I know this having spoken to suppliers who provide us with our grain, who are in contact with some of the best um, organic farmers in the country. And they've told me that they have suppliers who 
are passionate about traditional spell and that most of the stuff in the store is actually modern. And so the distinction of modern versus ancient is, I would say, largely marketing hyperbole. Um, and so the reality of it is that the variety of wheat is not the most important factor as far as um, whether it's ancient or modern. And that simple agricultural history makes it clear why um, common wheat and durham wheat are more popular in these times. Concerning the point about common wheat being a hybrid and whether it's worse than other types of wheat because it's hybridized, as discussed earlier in this um, video, we've seen that from ever since the wild demo was domesticated, every variety of wheat has been the product of crossbreeding with other types of grasses. It's not simply a case that um, the 1960s emerged, which is what is often cited as the Green Revolution with Norman Borlaug, who um, developed um, crossbreeding experiments um, in more recent times. Um, a lot of times there is the misconception that it's at that point that wheat started to crossbreed with other grasses, but actually this happened to even cause Bible wheat of the Emma variety, Durham wheat, common wheat, spelt, they, um, Corazon wheat, they all crossbred with other grasses long before um, any of um, the accusations about the 1960s. And um, what was, however, different from the 1960s was that with the Green Revolution, it was a situation whereby um, Norman Borlaug was involved in experiments to crossbreed wheat, and so the purpose was to provide greater yield of um, wheat to feed um, the world, um, especially the developing world. Um, and the interesting thing with that is that um, we might think, oh, crossbreeding or hybridization is a bad thing. But the reality is that wheat has always been crossbreeding with other varieties of, with other grasses. That's not something that happened in the 1960s. In fact, the crossbreeding experiments that took place were purely the result of crossbreeding different land races of wheat. So in other words, after humans isolate some wheat and grow it in different parts of the world and it becomes slightly different, the idea is that they then just cross-pollinate them, which if human beings hadn't separated them into different varieties and put them in different parts of the world and classified them differently, the reality is that wheat fields would be more genetically diverse anyway, rather than selectively chosen to have, for example, one field which is just full of one type of you know, wheat that has one type of genetic characteristic. And so effectively, the different varieties of common wheat were just crossbred. And why I don't see that as a problem is because if we take common wheat, let's just say Turkish red wheat or Japanese wheat, which was what was used in the 1960s, um, the characteristics of the Japanese wheat being short, like the Emma, or should I say short like the Einkorn, rather, um, was advantageous um, because it wouldn't lodge and cause, um, for example, the stalk to bend and for there to be greater losses of grain as it starts to spoil in the field. And so that older characteristic from it, from the einkorn is why um, I understand that the Japanese variety was used in the crossbreeding. Um, and so effectively, the point is that all varieties of common wheat they had just different um, sub-varieties which were crossed, but the fact of the matter is that they all came from the same origins anyway. So if you have the original, so if you had the common wheat that existed in ancient times, and then you had new varieties that were developed, and then those were crossbred, it's no different to, for example, if I have a group of horses, and some are brown and some are white and some are black, I send all the white horses to China, all the black horses to um, South Africa, all the brown horses to France. And then 10 generations later, I decide, hey, I want to crossbreed the ones from France with the ones from Japan. They all have the same grandparents, so I don't see what the problem is. Um, so effectively, that I bring that clarification just to show um, that this is the circumstance surrounding common wheat. And um, as far as um, the concerns around modern varieties of wheat, 
I believe that given the common origin, that the more important consideration is, is how it's grown rather than the variety, and then also how it's processed, which is something we'll get onto. Now for another important question, is ancient grain better, at least from a nutritional standpoint? Having looked at the properties of the different types of wheat, um, my conclusion is that no, I wouldn't say that ancient grain is necessarily better. In fact, from a nutritional standpoint, you'll find that there'll be variations between the different um, varieties of wheat when it comes to the nutrients that are contained. Um, so for example, some varieties may have more zinc, some may have more iron, some may have more calcium. And so therefore, the benefit I would say that can be derived from consuming wheat um, would be, be best done um, in just experimenting, having different types of wheat because then there is exposure to a wide spectrum of nutrients that are contained um, in the actual grain. Now, to take um, one example of a side-by-side -side comparison, we have spelt and also common wheat is cousin. And as mentioned, the main difference with spelt is that it's more water soluble and it has that um, tougher husk that encases the grain compared to the common wheat, which is um, less water soluble and um, is naked and therefore easier to thresh. Um, now, in the terms of the nutrition profile, for the most part, there aren't any fundamental differences. So the idea that spelt has more nutrition or is more nutrient dense is not backed up by the facts. The reality is that there are similarities between common wheat and spelt in terms of the overall nutrient profile. Um, so for example, spelt has slightly more omega-3s, which is a good thing because we do need more omega-3s. Um, and it has slightly more than common wheat. Um, but then another difference is the omega-6s. Now we don't want too many omega-6s, but spelt has slightly more omega-6s than common wheat. Is that a big issue? Not necessarily, but that's a slight difference. Another is in the area of um, selenium. So whilst we might consume spelt, for example, you'll find that the selenium content is very low and selenium is a very important nutrient which most of us are quite deficient in. Um, selenium is very low in spelt compared to common wheat. Common wheat has a lot more selenium in it. And then another difference is that spelt has a bit more sugar. But on a fundamental level, when we do a side-by-side -side comparison, there isn't any meaningful difference to suggest that one variety is better than another. Um, rather, I would recommend that for those who can consume wheat to just enjoy different varieties um, and use them and bake with them in different ways, depending on the properties they have and maybe in terms of just nutrition as well, just to widen the nutrient profile. Bible references to ancient grain. Now, one of the interesting things surrounding wheat is that in the marketplace, there are products that um, reference scripture in order to create a level of confidence in the purchaser in buying the product. Um, and one of these, um, for example, we know about um, the Ezekiel bread, um, which interestingly enough, if you look at the actual ingredients, there you'll find that there are some significant differences between what was made in the scripture versus what is sold in the stores. Um, however, another one is also this idea about spelt. Now, it's commonly suggested that spelt is in the Bible. And so just as an example, um, we're going to just consider whether that's actually true. Now, spelt um, is supposedly referenced in about four places. So, for example, Exodus chapter 9, verse 32, um, Isaiah, I believe, 28, verses 25 and 27, and then also Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 9. Now, the question is, is this true? So, we're going to just look at um, some verses, um, but before we get into those verses, um, having done some research as well, there was um, a study done um, on Bible plants and it talks about whether spelt was actually in existence in um, the Bible literature. Now the interesting thing is that spelt was unknown in Egypt 
and so therefore the likelihood that they will grow in spelts is um, is very small um, if you think about the fact that if it was unknown in Egypt then the children of Israel being in the land of Goshen wouldn't have likely grown spelt. In fact the earliest records of spelt are actually found in Transcaucasia which as I mentioned is around um, Georgia and Azerbaijan and even in the case of spelt there's different types of spelt so there is um, the variety Triticus spelter or Triticum spelter and then there's also a variety which emerges when common wheat crossbreeds with another grass it somehow becomes spelt again which makes sense because they're cousin so again the likelihood is that spelt was not in the literature and not in reference um, when the children of Israel were in the land of Goshen however we're going to just look at some verses um, so firstly if we look at Exodus 9 verse 32 it says but the wheat and the rye were not smitten for they were not grown up and so the word that is commonly associated with um, spelt is the word rye that is used and um, the word has a Hebrew which I believe is pronounced kukumeth um, the other reference is Isaiah 28 verse 25 which says when he hath made plain the face thereof doth he not cast abroad the fitches and scatter the cumin and cast in the principal wheat and the appointed barley and rye in their place again is that word rye which um, has been translated as spelt um, and then if we look at these words what's quite interesting is that there is a particular spelling in the Hebrew um, and we're going to find that as we look at other references um, we'll see where the, where the problem comes in now when we go to verse 27 of Isaiah there is another word that is mentioned and this is important because the word that we're going to be introduced to here is a very key part in unpacking where the problem of mistranslation comes from. So if we go to Isaiah 28 and verse 27, it says, For the fitches are not threshed with a threshing instrument, neither is a cart who are turned about upon the cumin, but the fitches are beaten out with a staff and the cumin with a rod. So the word which we are focusing in on is the word fitches. And here, this word in the Hebrew, as I understand it to be pronounced, is kasa. And this word typically describes black caraway or nigella sativa, which is where we get our black seed oil from. So here, that's fine, the fact that we have a word which clearly is describing this particular plant. But if we go to Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 9, we see that this same word fitches is applied once again and we will see that actually the unpacking of mistranslation begins here. So Ezekiel 4 verse 9 says, Take thou also unto thee wheat and barley and beans and lentils and millet and fitches and put them in one vessel and make thee bread thereof according to the number of days that thou shalt lie upon thy side. Three hundred and ninety days shalt thou eat thereof. Now the word here used for fitches is actually not kasa, it's actually another Hebrew word. And if we take this Hebrew word and compare it to the Hebrew word kukemef, which was used for the word rai in, in Exodus 9, we see that they look very similar. Now although these words look very similar, they are not the same. And this is important and I'll explain why. So the King James Bible translates this word fitches in Ezekiel 4 and verse 9. So it uses the word fitches to translate what this Hebrew word is. However, the NIV renders this word as spelt. Now, we might wonder to ourselves, why would the NIV do this? And the reason is because in Hebrew, the word kukemeth and this word here in Ezekiel 4 9, they're very similar, but they're not identical. And so what has happened is that the translators have taken this latter word in Ezekiel 4.9 merely to be a plural form of the former word, kukemeth. And so they, because there's this assumption that it must be a plural, they've then compared it to the Hebrew, or should I say the modern Hebrew word for spelt. Bear in mind, there is no ancient Hebrew word for spelt because it was unknown. 
but there is a modern word for spelt, which has obviously emerged in recent times um, in modern Hebrew. And because this modern Hebrew word for spelt or for today's spelt looks similar to this word in Ezekiel 4.9, we actually have found that the translators have assumed that this word in Ezekiel 4.9 is actually spelt. And so therefore, if this word is spelt, and if this word is just a plural version of what is found in Exodus chapter 9, the assumption is that every instance where we see Kukameth, we're going to translate it as spelt. Now, the King James Bible does not make this assumption. So to ensure that it is clear that the word here in Ezekiel 4.9 is not the same thing as the Rai in Exodus 9.32, it uses the word fitches so that it's clear, even though the word fitches is used to describe Nigella sativa, which is the black seed or black caraway that many of us know of, actually, this is not a problem because in Old English, it was a common thing for words to be used interchangeably. For example, the word rye in the um, Old English context was many times used to describe black caraway. So the translators of the King James saw it as no problem to use the word fitches to describe this grain that they see in Ezekiel 4 and verse 9, even though the word fitches is used to describe something else. And the reason why is because it appears that it was more important for them to make clear to the reader that the plant in Ezekiel 4 verse 9 is not the same plant as what is in Exodus chapter 9. Unfortunately, the NIV and other modern translators assume that the similar spelling of Ezekiel 4.9, um, or shall I say of the plant in Ezekiel 4.9, to the spelling of modern Hebrew for spelt, means that it must be spelt, and that by extension, because the word Rai in Exodus 9.32 is similar in appearance, wherever this word is found, it should be translated as spelt. And so this is where misinformation is coming in the sense that um, it might seem a romantic idea that if we buy spelts in stores today and it is advertised as something which is in the Bible, that we are buying a superior product. When the historical, the linguistic and the archaeological evidence speaks to the opposite fact. The earliest records, as I've mentioned a couple of times before, for spelt are actually in Transcaucasia, and that is a significant distance away from where the varieties of wheat that was in Bible times would have emerged. And so the historical context doesn't support the idea that spelt is in the Bible. And also, spelt was not known in Egypt either. And so, although it might be appealing, the idea of spelt being something that is found in scripture, the evidence does not support it. And unfortunately, is an example of how mistranslation has led to misinformation and has been taken advantage of by the market seeking to sell a product. So with all this said, the question to ask may be, what is the best wheat? The short answer is that the best wheat to consume is not necessarily a specific variety of wheat, but rather freshly milled wheat. Now the reason for this is simple. Um, in modern times of the rise of sicknesses, this, in my understanding, emerges primarily or largely as a result of the way that wheat is handled. So, for example, one incident of the glyphosate that is sprayed on the wheat um, that is grown in a lot of commercial fields. Some individuals may be responding or reacting to that. Um, but then I would say more importantly, the way that wheat is processed once it's harvested. So under normal circumstances, when we get our flour in traditional times, the flour would be provided fresh and people would use that flour in a short space of time. And the reason is because within 24 hours of milling wheat into flour, about 40% of the nutrients are lost. And then if you go down to three to four days, 
the nutrients are almost completely gone. Um, I believe this is partly why in scripture when we hear about the sanctuary the bread was changed regularly and the bread was changed so that it was fresh and so when it comes to the best wheat for us to consume freshly milled is the way forward because given that flour loses its nutrition so quickly and then on top of it the longer it's stored for as well naturally what happens is it will go rancid and it's best to have freshly milled now you might wonder well if i've had flour in my cupboard for two weeks it hasn't gone off why is that well given that flour naturally goes off and starts to go rancid and even in some cases as well as in the case of somebody i know who grew up in a rural environment where they had to throw out their flour quite quickly was because weevils would eventually hatch out of it because weevils will lay their eggs in the field. There's nothing you can do about that. Um, so the fact that you have flour that is sitting on the shelf is not going off, doesn't have any weevils coming out if you're having it for a long time or etc. that type of thing, shows you that something has been done to it. So firstly, if it has been stored for more than two weeks, for certain, there's virtually no nutrition in that flour. And so what then do the flour makers do? they have to add synthetic nutrients to it in order for there to be any nutri nutrition in it. But then also in order to stop it from going rancid, the vitamin E or the oil has to be extracted from it. And chemicals need to be added in order to preserve it so that it doesn't go off. So the reality is that freshly milled is the best way to go because you will not have these chemicals that are in there. You will not have the vitamin E removed and as for the best flour to consume for wheat, it really doesn't matter if you have bought einkorn, emma, durham, spelt, common wheat. If it's been sitting on a shelf from a commercial facility, and, there, and especially if there's no instruction to consume it quickly, then it most certainly has chemicals in it, especially if it's able to sit on the shelf without going off. The fact that the wheat may be a particular variety like einkorn doesn't, in a sense, um, magically make that problem go away. It doesn't, make it, it doesn't mitigate the fact that that's what happens to wheat or make it automatically better just because it's ancient grain. The fact of the matter is that freshly milled wheat flour is best regardless of what variety is and that that's more important than the variety per se. Now with that said, um, there are benefits as to why we have um, freshly milled wheat and those benefits are from a nutritional standpoint because it's said that 40 out of the 44 nutrients essential to the human body are found in a grain of wheat in its compartments of its bran, its germ, and its endosperm, which are the major components of the wheat. And the four that we cannot get in wheat, those nutrients oftentimes can be um, reclaimed by just sprouting the wheat, if you really want to go that far. The only one nutrient that can't be reclaimed out of the 44 is vitamin D3, but then, or should I say vitamin D, but then again, that comes from the sun. So effectively wheat, when it's consumed, freshly milled, contains all that nutrition. And human beings for a very long time were reliant on having healthy grains such as wheat, because especially during hard times, um, having a food source that can sustain the human body by having all of these nutrients in it, which other grains for the most part don't have all of these nutrients whether we're talking about all of the selenium and you know things like the zinc the iron um you know the um omega threes all of these different kind of things um that the human body needs which it cannot make if we actually consume freshly milled grain freshly milled wheat we get those nutrients back um it's not been stored for a long time um and as a result our bodies get a lot of nutrition, which many of us are deficient on in the Western diet. Um, an example of um, how freshly milled makes a massive difference is in the fact that experiments have been done where rats were fed on diets where they were given wheat flour that was stored for 
two weeks or more or bread that was made from flour stored for more than two weeks and within one to two generations the rats completely lost their fertility and in the case of pigeons that were also put on a similar program they developed beriberi which is a heart condition because the heart healthy nutrients that are naturally found in a grain of wheat um, the, vitam the, the B vitamins which many of us are deficient in um, by eating that type of flour those animals became deficient and lose things such as fertility and in the case of the pigeons developed heart problems and so it's a very important step as I understand it for those who can consume wheat, those who aren't celiac for example that freshly milled flour is the best way to go rather than what is in the store regardless of what variety of wheat it actually is. So now we reach the part of the video where we talk about why we decided to start uh, mill out, milling our own flour and also why we started growing our own wheat. So first of all we um, were fortunate enough to have a medical missionary visit um, our local congregation who did a study looking at the parallels between why Christ is likened unto wheat, the significance of wheat um, as an object lesson in scripture, but um, also he talked about um, the attack on wheat that is taking place and um, the benefits of milling our own flour because a lot of the problems that are being raised are primarily to do with the processing of wheat rather than the wheat itself and that just like with the scriptures where we benefit from actually studying for ourselves and taking our learning into our own hands likewise a similar thing with um with milling our own flour for the various health benefits that result um as well i also found that um through the process of um, milling our own flour and we noticed that even in shortages of flour such as during the lockdown etc having storage of um, wheat berries in the garage that we could bring out and mill our own flour uh, meant that that wasn't a problem for us and so it's a very good um, food security tip um, and then also I found that having spoken to some of the um, experts um, who are connected to the farmers that supply the grain that we buy um, that they confirmed many of the things that I'd been studying which was that um, ancient grain you know that different varieties of wheat including common wheat they're all ancient grain fundamentally and that rather um, there's a lot of um, misinformation that is going out um, and he mentioned the person I spoke to actually mentioned how some of their farmers are passionate about older varieties of spelt and that most of the stuff growing in the stores is actually modern varieties um, but yet they'll be marketed as being this ancient grain and the fact of the matter is that that may not matter too much but it just shows an example of misinformation um, and so we have as a result of milling our own flour and having this extra grain we just decided to start experimenting growing it in our allotment and um, as a result I've learnt a lot from the process um, we purchased a threshing machine and I've even threshed wheat um, last year we got about seven kilos off of our allotment um, which was good um, and also I started to understand practically why farmers moved away from whole wheat to the naked wheat when I tried to grow spelt um, first problem I had was that I didn't realize about the vernalization process whereby it needs cold in order to flower um, so the second time I attempted it it grew but I found that I could not thresh it to save my life that um, the, the hulls were not coming off and I totally understand why now the farmers abandoned it um, whereas with the common wheat it's hard enough on its own to thresh and winnow um, the grain in order to get um, a half you know in order to get um, a product um, so it makes complete sense and I guess if one was interested in food security and growing their own wheat grain naked would be the best way to go as it's the most accessible way for one to have a bit of control over their wheat supply if they wanted to grow it whereas growing hulled wheat which has this um, really tight husk around it is a bit of a non-starter for people who I don't even know what equipment you would use but I totally got to understand um, what has happened in history why the shift so that kind of gives a sense as to how we got into this journey.
Lastly, the story of Joseph gives us some really interesting illustration about why it is good in, to understand the proper way to deal with wheat. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, it's beneficial to have your own wheat berries, to mill your own flour. Um, as the story of Joseph shows, when the famine happened in Egypt, um, in the Genesis chapter 43, um, we had a situation whereby Egypt, because they stored grain, people were coming to purchase grain from them. And now they weren't storing flour because as I mentioned, you don't store flour, flour goes off. Um, and if it doesn't go off, it has chemicals in it. So the ancients knew that you store grain. And so if we think about in the future, if there was ever to be a crisis, it would be beneficial to grow to have your own wheat berries in storage because it is that way that you can be able to have something that can sustain yourself, which would have nutrients that would support the human body that a lot of other foods would be missing on their own. Um, so for example, the story of Joseph shows how the ancients knew that having grain such as wheat was important for adequate nutrition because in Genesis 43 verse 11, you see that when Jacob sent his sons to Egypt to see their brother, who they didn't know was their brother at the time, because um, his identity as Pharaoh was hidden, um, he told them to take the best of their fruit, the best of their nuts and their almonds. Well, if there's a famine, then how is it that they have fruits and almonds? Well, it was a famine because they understood that if the grain, which provides the majority of nutrients that the body can't produce, is not um, growing, then it doesn't matter if you have fruits or nuts or other things, you're still going to be nutrient deficient. So therefore, he used those to trade, or as a gift, should I say, um, in order to get the grain, because they knew that without grain, without that type of um, you know, nutrient profile of foods, that having other foods was not sufficient for sustaining the human body. And so this is just an object lesson, which I found quite interesting um, about this area and um, there's a channel that I've been looking at as well which is called Grains and Grits. I'll link it in the description which one can watch to find out more about this area of wheat and especially the biblical references. Thanks for watching today's episode. Please remember to like, comment, subscribe and share this video and stay tuned for the rest of this series from grain to loaf. Take care, bye.